Promol, Programmer's Micro Application Language. Whew, boy, I thought I'd never get this started. <laughs> so, my main interest in Commodore 64 is programming languages and operating systems. And there don't seem to be a lot of people working in that area. Most people seem to be interested in games or demos or BBSing, whatever that means nowadays. Um, but I think it's important to preserve this part of our history as well. Uh, and not just to, to uh, archive, because that's not really enough, but to capture the feeling of what it was like to program on this machine. And that's something that's sort of becoming a lost art. So I've been thinking for several years about doing a series of talks on some of the more interesting things in my collection. And so I'll start with the ProMol. When you're looking at these old programming languages, uh, there are a couple of common threads that keep on popping up when you, when you look at them and you say to yourself, is this interesting? Might this be useful? Do I actually want to write some code, some, com some code for my Commodore 64 in this language? And one of the first questions that always comes up is, does it support multiple drives and drives <coughs> other than 8 and 9? Because a lot of the old software, of course, by today's standards was a little short-sighted in that regard. Is there support for writing large, modular programs so that you can split your program up into little pieces? One of the reasons for that, of course, is that if you're going to develop on the Commodore 64, it's going to take some time, and you don't want to have to compile four, five hundred, a thousand lines of code every single time you have one mistake. Does it support assembly language? Of course, we all know that if you write some code on the Commodore 64, sooner or later you're going to need to use assembly language because you're going to have a need for speed. But that's not the only reason. You might want to uh, write support routines for some exotic new device that didn't even exist in the figment of the imagination of the person that created the language. So you have to be able to get to assembly language. Is there support for standalone programs? A lot of these old programming languages, you would boot them up and they'd come up into a shell and you'd have to enter all kinds of crazy commands to get the programs to run and all that kind of thing. If you want to actually write some code on your Commodore 64 and distribute it, you want your users to just be able to type load star 8 and run. Right? And of course, last but not least, does it have a good editor? Are you actually going to be able to write code? Okay? Because you'll find that if you start exploring these older programming languages, you will quickly become a connoisseur of editors. And believe me, they go from the ridiculous to the same. <coughs> so, Promo, why am I starting on Promo? I have a long history with Promo. I first encountered it many years ago on Q-Link, and there was a version available there for download with a bunch of other files, and it was called Promol 2.1e. And in retrospect, as far as I can tell, this is a, a, the demo version of Promol that somebody made modifications to for his own use. But I was just fascinated with it. I thought it was the coolest looking language, and I really wanted to learn it. The problem is, Promo was a licensed program. You had to pay good bucks for it. And this guy was apparently distributing the demo version of it with some handwritten docs, and it just wasn't enough. If you've ever learned a programming language, you know you have to have a good reference for the language syntax, you have to have a good reference for the API libraries, you have to have a good reference for the tools like the compiler and everything else. And I, I found I was just kind of like guessing, and I really couldn't. As neat as it looked, I just set it aside in frustration. I said, well, okay, I put those discs in the back of the box, you know, maybe that. And every couple of years I'd come back to it, and I'd go, oh yeah, right, Promol. You know, I'd run across those discs in the back of the box, right? And, yeah, I should give that another try and see if I can figure it out. Always ended up putting it away in frustration. Well, years pass, I set up a Commodore 64 website, some of you guys might know online, labs.org, and I put up a page with showing off my collection of programming languages and operating systems, and I put Promol up there, and I put a message on there saying, by the way, this is not the full version of Promol. If anybody's got the full original version of Promol, holler me, because I'd really love to have it, right? Well, guess what? Somebody hollered me. And last winter, I heard from Jeff over at Vintage Volts. Do you guys know that site at all? VintageVolts.com? Yeah, he's one of us. He's, he's got an interest not only in computers, but all old electronics, TVs, radios, all this kind of stuff. So he sends me this email saying, well, I have a complete copy of Promol. I, 
have everything. I can send you all the disk images, PDFs of all the manuals. Would you like a copy? Or I'm like, I'd like a copy. You could have tipped me over with a feather. I've been looking for this for 20 years, right? So he sent it all to me, immediately put it on my site, started going through it. Over and over, I found myself saying, oh, so that's how this works. And, and I was just overjoyed. Bizarrely, within a couple of weeks of that, I was on IRC, and I think it was Peyton said to me, well, you know, there's a complete copy on eBay as well. <laughs> within a couple of weeks, after 20 years of looking, okay. So I got the copy on eBay, which was the, the originals. Jeff, of course, kept his, naturally. Um, but I now have a complete set of original promo with the discs in the, in the uh, envelope with the seal pulled back, you know, and the four or five hundred pages, literally, of printed documentation. And uh, also a bunch of uh, newsletters and sales brochures and stuff like that that DLH just scanned a few minutes ago. So that'll go on my site uh, probably by the time I get home. And I put that on my site as well. I kind of collated those two collections. So now I have Promal, except that there's one thing missing. The people that made Promal also published for a large amount of money the source code for Promal. So if anybody ever runs across the source code for Promal, holler me because I would really like to have it. Now, um, if you get interested in Promal and you decide you want to try it out in your 64, there are a couple things you should be, should be uh, aware of. First of all, it probably won't even load on your Commodore 64. And the reason for that is, is that it came with a built-in speed loader, a disk speeder, and it's just awful. God, I hope there aren't any of the original authors here. <laughs> but it's really, it's incompatible with so many things, I don't even want to describe it because it's too depressing. Right? So the best advice I can give is, use that poke, turn it off permanently, and save it that way, all right? You know, save a pristine copy if you want, but use that poke turn it off once and for all and just leave it off. And that poke, by the way, comes uh, directly out of the, the Promal documentation. It not only turns it off, it completely disables it. The second thing is, um, Promal does, out of the box, support two drives, by default eight and nine. And the runtime actually opens the command channel on both drives when it starts up and leaves it open all the time, which I guess is okay. He gives you a way with, with an API call to get at the command channel. But he opens it. The pseudocode for the opening is open 15815i0. Okay, he's assuming he's loading from 8, so why does he need to send an i0? I'm not sure quite. Okay, but no harm, no foul, right? Then he turns around and goes open 14915i0. So if you've got another floppy on drive 9, and you don't have a disk in it, and you send it an I-0, what happens? Exactly, right. So you have two options. Either always keep a disk in the drive, and I guarantee you'll forget, or try this book. This one comes from me disassembling Promal, and I can, I can tell you the gory details if you want, but it essentially tells it to ignore the I-0 and just open the command line or the uh, command channel without a final date. So, Promal, the environment that comes up when you boot it. Promal is one of those languages that does actually boot up. It boots up to a shell, and it's a really nice shell. It's actually got command recall. So if you, for example, have a compile, and you're using a whole bunch of arcane options on the command line for the compile, oh, nuts, I have one mistake. So you go back in the editor, you correct your mistake, you've got to compile again. Oh, my geez, what were those options? Just recall the command with Control V. Boom, you're good to go. It even supports batch files. In fact, there's support for an auto-exec batch file. You'll see that in the demo. I, I, I plan to do about half yak in here and about half real life demo on the machine. So you'll see that. Um, there is a standalone runtime. So you can take your finished program, run it through utility, and end up, end up with something where the user can just type load star 8 and run. Promal is not an interpreted language, it's a compiled language, <coughs> but it doesn't compile down to machine language, it compiles down to P code. But it's very efficient and very fast. I haven't done any benchmarks, but it's, it's good. It, it runs really fast. 
There is support for multi-module programming. You can do, I, I don't have time to go into all the details, but you can write overlays and multiple modules, as well as doing chaining from one program to another. It's got an adjustable memory map. You can do something very like what you can do in BASIC, where with, the, with a well-placed poke, you can adjust the amount of space available to the heap. You can do things like that, and actually things are a lot more sophisticated than that. It's got floating point support, but there's actually a command you can type at the command line to remove the floating point support, and it gives you back two and a half extra kilobytes that are no longer needed because that code's not there anymore. The memory map keeps moving around. More on that in a minute. The assembly support is superb. There are several different ways you can do assembly language. I'll only talk about a couple of them. But one of them is there's actually a language keyword, JSR. And it does exactly what you think it would do. In fact, you can load the registers beforehand and you can inspect the registers afterwards because he saves them right after he comes back from the call. So you can do something like calling the kernel open routine, checking to see if the carry flag is set, and then looking at the error code in the accumulator and doing whatever you need to do with it afterwards. Very sophisticated assembly support. It does not have a dedicated debugger. In other words, you can't run your program under control of a step through debugger. There were not a lot of high-level languages in the Commodore that supported that kind of thing. There were a few. I know Abacus COBOL is one of them. Uh, however, if you ask nicely, the compiler will give you a formatted listing. Does some, would somebody like me to, to do me a favor, please? I forgot something. Can somebody go over? Jim, you want to do me a favor? Please? Sure. Can you go over to my table? In my briefcase, under the table, is a green paper folder with some program listings in it. Can you go grab them, please? Yeah. Thanks, I appreciate it. I knew I could get something. Um, if you ask nicely, the compiler will give you a, a formatted listing. That's why I asked them to do that, because I have some, some uh, listings printed out for you guys to look at. It'll give you a formatted listing with uh, address offsets showing where each line of P code is and where all your variables are in there. And there's a hex dump command, just like in machine language monitor, with your classic hex bytes on the left, characters on the right kind of display. So you can break out of your program, examine memory, and then start at the end and all that kind of thing. But no, no dedicated email. Now, here's the really weird thing about Chrome. Compiled Promal P code images are relocatable. Why would they? That's it. Thanks very much. Why would a P code image be relocatable? The reason is Promal leaves a program in memory once you run it. And so you're running program A, and then you decide to run program B. A is still going to be in memory. I mean, picture the development cycle, for example. You're using a bunch of small utilities over and over again. And as long as there's room, we'll keep piling on up to a total of six programs. So there's no telling where they might be loaded. That does not, by the way, apply multitasking. But if you, to take that same example, say you run program A, then you run program B, which might be some other utility, and then you decide you want to run A again, He's going to run it from memory without, you know, he's going to avoid the disk access by running it from memory again first. In fact, not only will he run it from memory or rerun it from memory, he's going to check some it first to make sure that you haven't stomped all over it with some badly written program. So he's, he's looking out for it. Now that has some side effects too that will become evident in a minute. But to, one of the things you can do is to unload programs in memory either by name, or you can just say, unload them all, give me a clean slate. Here's another thing you can do with assembly because of this, this uh, relocatable image thing. A relocatable Promal P code image has three parts. There's a, there's a little header at the beginning that has, I don't know, I guess the name, the checksum, a flag, whether it's P code or assembly. And then there's the code, which is the second section. And then if necessary, there's a relocation table at the end so that you can do address fixing. You can take a piece of assembly code built with any assembler you please and pass it through a relocate utility and end up with 
a relocatable ProMol image. The way that works is you assemble your code at some arbitrary address, doesn't matter where because who knows where it's going to be loaded anyway, right? You assemble it at some arbitrary address, then you assemble it a second time at an offset of 100 hex. Follow where that's going to go? So then you run the relocate program with those two objects as the argument. He looks through them and he says, okay, fine. He writes out the little header, copies the code. Then he compares the two. And for every place that there's a difference of 100 hex, which is going to be the page, right? He writes a relocation entry. And voila, when he's done, you have a relocatable ProMol module made out of assembly language. Here's one of the side effects of that. If you have a main program and then a reusable module, my demo program I'm going to show does exactly that, for example. Say, say you have a reusable module that's, for example, quoter for the Flyer Network card. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. You have to actually have that module loaded first before you load the main program. Because he's got to know where the module is located so he can do address fix-up so that the main module knows where to reference the code he's calling in the module. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Yeah. So what's the solution? You have to have a third program, which is a little stub loader. And the stub loader loads the module, then loads the main program, passes control to it. I'll show examples of that. That's, that's really, you know, if you think about it, that's really not that unusual in the common world, especially if you see programs that are mixed basic and machine language. It's not unusual to see a program that starts with a little stub loader, puts everything in memory where it's supposed to be, and then jumps to the main Editor and compiler are really nice. Interestingly, the code, all the code generated by Promol, everything that Promol does is true ASCII, not Petsky. I'm not sure if, if it's because of this or not, but uh, Promol was also available for the Apple 8-bit computers. Before anyone asks, I have not seen that in the wild, so I, I don't know if it's available, if it's out there or whatever, but that may be why it's true ASCII, which of course makes it very easy to get listings on your PC, which is what I did here. Um, the editor, full screen editor, it's got four way scrolling, indent, outdent, hold that thought, it's got indent, outdent, cut and paste, search and replace, all the good stuff. It's got a very full featured runtime API with file handling, string manipulation, all the good stuff you would expect. There are also add on libraries that you can use if you want, including a very full featured graphics library. You can do stuff like uh, draw the arc of a circle, fill it with a pattern, or print text on the on the high res screen at arbitrary point sizes in any location you please, all that kind of thing. It's got conditional compilation. The example they give in the docs is suppose you want to write your program for both the Commodore 64 and the Apple 8 bit machine. Well you just put conditional compilation in, in there and then you compile it, you pass the appropriate flag to the compiler and you generates one piece of code or the other, but you have a single single piece of source code for it. There's also cross-reference utility, which is very nice because it'll generate a cross-reference of your source code, even if it does not yet compile. So it'll help you to get it <coughs> to compile. Language features. We're getting close to the demo now. Promol is very, like, schizophrenic. I mean, it's got all these features of what, of what we think belong in different languages. One thing is, it's got mandatory indentation like Python. Okay, so remember I said the editor has indent, outdent, guess why? Okay, you, if you have an if block, for example, it will say if, condition, statement, 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 and no and if. It's, it's based on the indentation. It's got pointer arithmetic. That seems like an odd combination, but it does actually have pointer arithmetic, and that turns out to be a pretty big deal in Pro Bowl because, for example, strings are stored as an array of bytes with a null terminator at the end. Simple data types, just byte in word real, and, and uh, by the way, int and word are the same length, but it is signed and word is unsigned. Notice that there's no pointer type. Okay. When you assign a pointer in Promol, you make it a word variable, and then when you dereference, you tell Promol what kind of, what type of data you're pulling from it. You would say, okay, here's the variable, dereference me a byte, dereference me an int, or whatever. It's got uh, true and false or reserved words, blah, blah, blah. 
procedures and functions. Very nice support for structured programming. So it's got both procedures and functions. They have arguments and they have true local variables. You can even name them the same as something in the main line and it won't disturb it. And the labels for procedures and functions can be up to 31 characters. Oh, the luxury of it. Fantastic. <laughs> variables must be declared. They're not initialized, so you have to initialize them yourself. You know, no assuming that it turns out to be a zero. Escape and refuge is basically like a, a combination of uh, on error, go to, and set jump, long jump. And recursion is not only possible, but supported. I can't remember off the top of my head if it's a certain number of layers deep you can go or you wait until something bad happens. But recursion is supported. Uh, one more thing before I start the demo. Um, there are some things about disk handling that are a little weird in Promol, for Commodore 64 users anyway. On a Commodore, when we think of zero colon and one colon, of course, we think of unit number. I think the old 4040 drives, for example, where the whole thing, you had two mechanisms in one cabinet, and that whole cabinet would be drive eight. And then the drives, the units, rather, would be zero colon and one colon. When Promal says zero colon and one colon, he means first drive and second drive, which again by default are eight and nine, although you can override that. The other thing is that the docs continually refer to the word channel when they mean a logical file. Now again, commoner users, when we hear the word channel, we think secondary address, right? So if you decide to have a look at Promal and you look in the docs and you see, oh, channel, it's the first of those three numbers in an open statement, not the third. Uh, also, I mentioned earlier that he keeps the command channels open all the time, so that eats up 15 and 14 for logical file numbers. The Promal file APIs, the library APIs, start at 2 and go up. So they recommend that if you're going to do your own file handling and assembler, you start, you know, 8 or 9, start somewhere in the middle and go up. So, uh, there's my URL, there's a bunch of stuff about Promal there, I'll have the slides and a D64 of the uh, uh, demo code available there within minutes after this is all over. And there's also a cheat sheet there, and if you have any questions, I think this is going to go right up to an hour, so I probably won't have a lot of time to take questions. In the meantime, here's one of those fancy listings I was talking about, and let's kind of... Uh, I only have a few, so if you're a programmer, grab one, and if you're not, no. <laughs> Just pass it. Because <laughs> I've only got a few. Um, so let me then start with the demo, and let's see if the gods are going to be kind to me here. Okay. Baby, baby, baby. Oh, I was going to run this demo off a of CMD hard drive, but we had a disagreement. <laughs> um, however, I've been doing all my promo work from a native partition on a CMD hard drive, so there are no compatibility issues there. And what I did apparently get to work just before I started talking is uh, a micro IEC. <coughs> I have a D81 image on a micro IEC, and that also seems to work just fine. So with all the talk of cranky speed loaders and you know weird device numbers and all that other stuff, it, it, it is overall <coughs> very compatible, so there shouldn't be much problem. All right, I'm going to, there, I'm already there. So I'm just going to fire up Promal then. Now when Promal starts, he loads the editor and then he loads the shell, which is called the executive. He always loads both. The reason for that is he loads the editor under the I.O. chips at D000. The reason for that, again, is to avoid a disk access. So if you're using the shell and you switch to the editor, he'll try and swap them in memory rather than have to do a disk access, which is very nice for you as a program. Now, I said that uh, there's support for batch files and even an auto exec file. We're seeing the auto exec file run now, and you always want to set the date because it'll appear on the compiler list, as you can probably see it at the top of each page there. And 
and there's your shell prompt. Okay, now we're ready to do some promo. Let's have a look at that uh, auto exec script. <coughs> Okay, so oddly the color command does not allow you to set the border color. So the second line is essentially a poke, you know, poke 532800. Then there's the date command, which we saw, and then I'm using the unload command. Remember I said you can unload all the programs out of memory to start with a clean slate. So that's what I'm doing when I start up promo. Now, for debugging, remember I said we have the map and the dump commands. So let's see what a map look map command looks like when we first start Chrome with a clean, clean slate. Okay, object programs, nothing is loaded. You see they load you know, kind of high, but there's a very powerful powerful runtime there, and we're doing everything with really compact bytecode, so that's that's really not a problem. I'm not going to go into what all that stuff means because there just isn't time. Uh, but notice that there's some space for shared variables upstairs there. Now, the demo program I wrote, and uh, I wanted to write it for the flyer because the flyer is kind of an odd beast. Uh, if, you, if you guys know the flyer network card, it answers on device 7. And, you know, <coughs> one of the things I was asking myself at the beginning is, can I get some of these old languages to access odd devices with odd protocols and so forth? So I wrote a program to get the weather from a weather service for Weather Underground. Okay. Now I have to admit I cheated because I couldn't, uh, the flyer seems to have a problem with really long URLs. And the URL that I had to send to Weather Underground was like about like this, okay? And part of it was my API key. And if you've worked with any of these services, you know a lot of times you have to use a long, a long uh, hex API key. So what I did was I cheated. I wrote a, a uh, like a proxy server that's running at home on my web server. What happens is we're going to send the city and state to the proxy, which in turn turns around and sends that long URL over to Weather Underground. Weather Underground does his thing, sends back a huge pile of JSON, which my proxy parses, and sends back just a list of days and forecasts. Okay. So now when I start it, I'm going to start it by typing weather. That's the stub one. And it's, it's going to be very quick. You're just going to see two very quick messages, loading flyer module, loading main module, and then boom, it'll be up and ready. So again, the stub loader loads the flyer module, and then the main module passes control to it. Boom. That's about the same speed that when it runs off a CMD hard drive. It'll be a little slower on the plot. So let's see what the weather's going to be like for, oh, I don't know, Lombard, Illinois, let's say. When I hit enter, <coughs> there are going to be two status messages. Actually, there's a third one, but one goes so fast you won't even see it. There will be two status, status messages there. One says reading, and one says parsing. Okay. When it says reading, that's that double round trip, going to my proxy server, going to Weather Underground, coming back with a pile of JSON, changing the JSON into something we can read, and then at that point, we switch from reading to parsing. So here we go, reading. Parsing. Yes. <laughs> and there it is, the weather for Lombard. <laughs> so we page through this uh, because it sent back several days. Now this this uh, display here may seem a little bit slow, but I'm actually doing word wrapping, so I'm inspecting every single byte, and it's it's probably not not the most efficient code in the world. But it was written for a demo. It was written, wasn't written to be a fancy finished program that's going to be the, the killer app or anything like that. So okay, there's there's the weather program. Now let's have a little look at the guts of this stuff. Let's rerun that map command and see what we're getting now. Aha! Now we have three programs in memory. Here's the first one, which is the stub loader. And Promol allocates everything by the page, so he allocated one page for that tiny little stub loader. Then comes the flyer module, three pages, and notice this, his variables are attached to the object code, they come right after. Okay. 
then comes the main program. By the way, the, the uh, back arrow turns into a true ASCII underscore in promo, since there's no such key on the comma or keyboard. His code loads starting in 5400 hex, but look here, the variables are upstairs. Okay. There's a reason for that. The flyer <coughs> module was purposely compiled with the keyword own, which means he owns his own variables. In other words, they're attached right on. The reason for that is, again, the calling program has to know where those variables are so we can reference them. So it has to be attached to the, to the uh, module's code. All right, now let's do a little debugging exercise. When, what I do here is all the data that comes back from my proxy server, I just dump it all into memory and then I parse it into two tables, a table of days and a table of forecasts. But first it all comes in as this long stream. Now of course in a real program you would parse the stream in C2, not store it in memory, but this makes for a good demo. Right? So we want to know what does that look like in memory? What does that raw data look like in memory? Okay. Well, if you look on one of those listings, there are, each of those listings has three, each of those printouts has three listings there. And the third one is called Weather Main. And if you look on the first page of that, actually I think I can get at it here too. No, I can't. But if you look near the bottom of the first page, there's, a, there's an array called um, Raw. It's an array of 8192 8, bytes, right? So we want to see that. How do we get to it? All right, well, Weather Main has his variable starting upstairs at 7 alpha 0, 0. What's the offset of raw? C2. C2. Charlie 2. Okay. That's not quite enough information. Promol, like many other languages, stores scalars first and then arrays. And when he gives you the offset of an array, that's the offset within the array section. So we need to know the length of the scalar section. It's actually on the compiler listing, but there's another way you can get to it. You can say size weather main, and it'll tell you now in, in you know delicious detail here exactly how much code is used, and exactly how how much shared variable space is used, and that we have 10 bytes of scalars. That's what the third number means. So. Our variables start at 7 alpha 0, 0. We have 10 bytes of scalars, so that's 7 alpha 0 alpha. And we have an offset of Charlie 2 for the, uh, for the array, so that's 7 alpha Charlie Charlie. Let's dump it. There it is. I'm always sending back the first three bytes accurate and accurate. If it's a NAC, the rest of the message is gonna, the rest of it is an error message, we're done. If it's an ACK, we have a day followed by this is an ASCII pipe, true ASCII pipe. A day followed by a pipe, followed by plentiful sunshine. Oh I love that. And then two pipes, day, <laughs> pipe, forecast, two pipes, and so on and so on. Okay. So Right after that, if you look at the listing, right after that come those two tables, a table of days and a table of forecasts. We can look at those two if we want. We know that, that that extremely wasteful raw data table takes up 8K or 2000 hex, right? So let's just recall that dump command. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> and we'll change it from 7 alpha to 9 alpha. And then we should see Sure enough, there's the table of days, and right after them, plentiful sunshine. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, and there's the next one, and you can see I just, I just, I was really profligate with memory. I just left really a lot of space there, and that was the end of that. Oh, look at that, that's interesting. Okay, so that's how you debug a ProMol program. Let's look at a little bit of source code. Since we just used up a lot of memory, I'm going to unload again before I go in the editor. Except that's not going to work. So first, let's look at the stub loader. Promot has this concept of uh, 
file extensions. So there's a .s is source, .l is listing, .c is compiled, and so forth. And most of the ProMol utilities are smart enough to know to tack on the right extension after the end. So if I say edit weather, he's going to bring up weather.s. <coughs> and there it is. Okay, there's, there's only a little bit interesting in here. Here's a program declaration. Nothing special there. I'm bringing in a couple of include libraries, yada, yada, yada. Here the program begins. There are really only two lines of interest. Here's the first one. Load the flyer module. And we pass the loader an argument that says load no go, which means load it, but don't execute. The promo loader is very sophisticated. There are actually six different flags that you can pass it in various combinations, like load and run this, and as soon as it finishes running, unload it from memory and stuff like that. It's the, the combinations are almost endless. So we load the flyer module, then a little bit of error checking. Oops, excuse me, I didn't want to do that. I don't know what to do this. And then we say, load the main module. And loader with no arguments means load it and run it. And that's what happens. And when, when main is loaded, he says, yeah, I'm <coughs> calling into flyer. The loader says, oh yeah, okay, I've got that in memory. Here's, here's where it starts. You can do your address fix up. Now here's something else interesting about the editor. Notice that some of these lines have a highlighted character on the end. It means just what it looks like. There's more to the right. Of course, we have a 40 column screen. You can, you can move to the end of that line without disturbing the rest of the screen. Okay. In fact, you can move the whole screen over. Suppose I want to move the cursor over to here and say, I would like to see all of both of those messages since they have to line up vertically. Let's just shift the whole screen over. Okay, fine. Now, obviously, everything is highlighted this way because everything has something to the left. We can still go like this, beginning and beginning and we can put the screen back the way it was. So there are a lot of neat little tricks like that that you can do in the ProMol editor. Now, let's look at that flyer routine, because that's got a lot of interesting code in it. First of all, notice the program declaration. It's different this time. <coughs> program flyer, own, Export. Own means he owns his own variables. They're going to be attached at the end of the program instead of being dumped upstairs in the heap. And export means I'm going to be exporting addresses for other pieces of code to call into. So now when we go down through the code here, we see, for example, export procedure close flyer, export function returning a word, get stat. Okay, and for each one of these export entries, He's going to generate an offset and put it in an include file. I'll show you that in a minute. So here's some of that mandatory indentation code I talked about. Here's a complete conditional. No end in. And here's another one. Oops. Here's another one. If with no end in. And they're both contained within a while with no end. That's what promo code looks for this kind of thing. Now, what this routine is, <coughs> is all this is, this is, this is just a little utility function that, that you pass the address of a string, which is the output of the command channel, like 0, OK, 0, 0, or whatever. And it returns the nth field from that, parsing on the commas, right? Com common thing to do. So we're passing. Buffer, which is the address of that string, 0, OK, 0, 0. And field, which is the number of the field that we want to extract. So buffer is a word variable, but it's a pointer. Promal doesn't know it's a pointer, but we're going to tell him it's a pointer. And here's how we do that. This is how you dereference a pointer in Promal. We say, uh, by the way, use that as a pointer and the left angle means you reference a byte. It's it's like at sign dot to to dereference floating pointer. I don't remember all the rest of it. So that's how you dereference a pointer. 
and you can see here that we're incrementing the pointer and walking right through it. A lot like C language. Now, here's some of the assembler stuff. <coughs> this is just great. This is so easy to do in ProMob. How many of you guys have done kernel compresses for kernel programming? So you know the set LFS, you know, open set name, all that stuff. So how easy is this, right? We're going to JSR set LFS, and before we do that, we're going to load the accumulator with an 8, the X register with a 7, and the Y register with a 15. Pretty easy stuff. I will probably have to go to bed without supper because I didn't do any error checking on the first one, but I did do it on the second one. Okay. <laughs> so now we're saying open 979, and again, device 7 is the flyer, so you want to open a command channel and a data channel. So here is how you do some, some string work. When you call set name, of course, you pass the length of the file name and the low byte and the high byte of the address of the file name. So here's the length of the file name. This is a promo library function, length of string. This notation here, colon less, that's actually kind of similar to what you do in assembly a lot of times, right? You say less to get the low byte. So we're saying the low byte of the address of the argument URL, here's the low byte and the high byte. So we're loading those into the registers and calling sit, uh, set name. Couldn't be easier. Now, here's the example I gave earlier. We're going to call open. Reg F and reg A, for example, are reserved words that mean the registers after the call. So we're going to call open. We're going to do JSR to open, and then we're going to say if Register, register F, in other words, the, the status register, the flags register, and reg FC, which is 0, 1, right? <laughs> so if the value of the flags register ended with 0, 1 is non zero, in other words, branch on, branch on carry set, then we know we have an error. And we take reg A, which is the accumulator, put in the error variable that we've declared, return that. And we're done. So that's that's how you can get at the low-level kernel routines from Promo without writing any assembly and without writing any assembly language. Try and do that in basic. Try and do this in basic. Now I'm going to go even lower. I found I've had best results with the flyer instead of using like check in, check out, check out, carry in, carry out, third channel. I use listen, talk, CI out, acceptor. I use the low-level stuff. So here I'm saying load accumulator seven. JSR, listen. By the way, the C in front of everyone, that, that's just, uh, I made an include file with all the kernel routines and I put a C in front of every name to just, just to avoid name collisions because Comal has its own open, for example. So this essentially says load accumulator 7, JSR, listen. Okay. Now we're looking at status, okay, dollar 90. This is just how you would write this kind of code in assembler. Load accumulator dollar 90, branch minus, done. Return dollar ninety, and then here again you can see an example of walking through the buffer that we're gonna that we're gonna output, checking to see if we've hit the zero byte at the end, and if not, call CI out with that buffer as an argument. That's what we're loading into the accumulator before we send it on its way. Here's another routine where we're reading from the flyer, very similar, same kind of stuff, very similar, except course that the difference here is we're checking for and a file. Okay, so this is like in basic if st and 64, same thing. There. So it's it's a lot easier to write this kind of stuff in Promol than doing it all in assembly, which is more prone to error and so forth. It takes long longer to uh, code. And here's the end of this flyer module. It has no main line because it's just a reusable module that you call into. Now let me go back up to the top. Again, it said program export. That means that Promol is going to generate an export file for this module, which is a .e extension. And here's what the compiler generated. <coughs> there are the offsets for all of those exported procedures and functions, most of the functions. So then, when you get to the main program, the 
first thing he does is, or one of the first things, include flyer.e. So now, when he loads, he's telling the loader, okay, I I'm going to be able to, I want to be able to call into there at the following offsets, do the address fix up for me so you know where to call it, based on where the flyer module got loaded, because who knows where it might get loaded. Um, yeah, here's that data we looked at, oops, the giant wasteful array of raw data, and the days table and the forecast table, that's the stuff we looked at. Here's another interesting thing about Promal. Promal actually has a no-op reserved word called nothing. Right? This is your classic hit any key routine. How do, you, how do you write that on a Commodore 64, right? You empty the keyboard buffer, then you wait for the keyboard to no longer be empty. And of course, that happens during interrupt time. When the user hits a key, the interrupt handler stuffs it into the keyboard buffer. So we start off by saying, this is NDX, Charlie 6, right? We're going to set it to zero. And by the way, that M um, notation, that means That means uh, reference memory at that location. So M0 means the address is zero. M49152 would mean the memory address C000. So we're setting the number of characters in the keyboard buffer to zero. Then we're saying repeat nothing. Repeat nothing until the number of characters is no longer zero. That's a promolism if ever I saw one. Repeat nothing. Um, there's just a little bit more here that's interesting. Here's a... Um, Do you have to say nothing, or could you just have nothing in there? No, you have to actually have, have that in there. I, I always think of it as being like... Um, what's that one movie? Two guys are at the it's like a Chinese drive through or something, and they only want egg rolls. Like and the lady keeps on going, and then... Right? <laughs> Then nothing. Okay. Um, I'm going to search here for the functional key routine because I know that that's in a choose. Yeah, here's a choose, which is like a switch statement. In a switch statement, you have to always have an else clause. And if you're not going to do anything with it, then you say else nothing. We only wanted the egg rolls. Right? Else nothing. So that's another another true chromalism right there, and that's about it really. This is the uh, main line of the program. It saves and restores the colors, blah blah blah. And you can see that that goes on the uh, screen. That's about all I had, and it didn't take quite as long as I thought it was going. Uh, so we need questions. Anybody got questions? Yeah. Does does it deal with text as well as decimal? Easily, or do you have to write your own code? To text work? as in strings? You mean? Hex. hex. Oh, hex. Uh, within the language, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, actually. Can you compare hex values as well as decimal? Or yeah, you, you have to look because a lot of times it depends uh, on which API you're calling. But a lot of the APIs actually require you to enter stuff in hex and you don't even put a dollar sign in front. So it's pretty smart about where you need it. How you enter it. But you can't just enter hex anytime you want. Like if A equals hex. I, I, I think you can. I think I think if it doesn't require hex input, you could put the dollar there and use hex input anyway. Any other questions? Alrighty. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Both fourth and fourth pro uh, I've got all this stuff at my table, so if you want to come and see any of it, you know, come pay me a visit.